Hi, my name is Romilly Cavanaugh. I'm an environmental engineer based out of Vancouver, British Columbia, and a former employee of Trans Mountain Pipeline. I'm now standing with Indigenous people, environmental activists, and others protesting the expansion of the pipeline. Uh, the reason why I'm opposed to the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, well, there's numerous reasons actually. Uh, it's bad for the climate, it tramples on Indigenous rights, it's being put forward as economically uh, beneficial to Canadians, which it isn't. And there's so many better ways that we could be spending taxpayers' dollars at this point. It's also a huge danger to the environment in terms of the construction itself, as well as the operations. Uh, spill, if it were to occur in the Salish Sea or actually anywhere along the pipeline route, would endanger fish, birds, mammals, people. Uh, there's just so many better ways for Canadian tax dollars to be used. So when I worked at Trans Mountain Pipeline, I started off as an environmental engineer. I'd just been out of university for a couple years at that point. And after I'd been there for five years, I was promoted up to the level of senior environmental engineer. So my responsibilities there included preparing for spills, cleaning up after spills, uh, getting permits through the government for construction projects like they would have done for this expansion, reaching out to the community to let them know what was happening, um, essentially anything related to the environment. So I was apprehensive about taking that job initially and was headhunted for that position, but I started there in the early 90s and in the late 80s, there was the Exxon Valdez spill that happened up in Alaska. So I knew that there was a lot of risk associated with these kinds of projects. Um, but I kind of rationalized working there, thinking I could do the best possible job to protect the environment within the constraints of what my role was. But in reality, it's a dirty industry. It's dangerous to people in the environment. It's now that the government owns it a waste of taxpayers' dollars. And there was really no way to change the danger associated with the pipeline or the dirtiness of the industry itself in terms of spills, contamination, climate change. So it became a very disheartening place to work as an environmentalist. And I realized there was really no way to change it. Uh, we really need to start shifting over to renewable energy. The risks are minimal compared to what's happening with oil and gas. Any kind of industry has impacts associated with it. There's mining for the metals that are required. There's always energy, water, and so on with any kind of industry, but compared to the oil and gas industry, those impacts are minimal. So at some point, it just became a place that I didn't feel comfortable working in at all. And I now work in the area of dealing with climate change, looking at carbon footprints of organizations, helping them to reduce their impacts, helping them to decarbonize. And it's just a much more fulfilling place to be for me as an environmentalist. The issue that we're facing in Canada and many other parts of the world is that the oil and gas industry controls many aspects of the government. Within Alberta, they have a lot of control over regulations, over what they pay in royalties, over how much they pay for taxes. They've captured that government system. And that really surprised me as an engineer. So an example of that was in BC if there was a spill. The soil that's impacted, the trees, any of the materials that are used to clean up a spill are classified as a hazardous waste because they are a hazard. They're a hazard to the environment and they're a hazard to the workers' health. They need to be packaged up in a way that's safe, they need to be transported in a way that's safe, and they need to be disposed of in a responsible fashion. In Alberta, oil and gas waste of that nature was not classified as a hazardous waste. It makes no sense. You cross the border from BC to Alberta, the chemicals are exactly the same. So it's clear that the government is captured by this industry because it's made so much money in the past. But it's time now we have to transition. So in the US, for example, there's five times more jobs in the renewable energy sector than in oil and gas. There's investment in solar panels, there's investment in wind energy. But when the subsidies are all going to the oil and gas industry, there's no way for renewables to compete. So if we look at the economics of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, the original company, which is what I worked for, was valued at $5 billion. It was over-assessed, but that's what the government paid for it. And they're now looking to put at least $7 billion, and probably much more than that, into the expansion itself. With that same amount of taxpayers' dollars, we could have had millions of homes outfitted with solar panels. There's a ton of work involved in that. We could have had millions of subsidies going into electric vehicle purchases and charging stations in every 
city across Canada. There's so much work there, but it's not getting the support that we need from the government. So we have a golden opportunity right now with the pandemic, where the government is infusing tons of money into keeping industries going, where we can shift from an old antiquated way of looking at the world, an old antiquated way of assigning where the money's gonna go and put it into green energy. It's, it's, it's the future. <laughs> Why are we still working with an industry that is so out of date and so dangerous to people both in Canada and around the world? Even if we thought as Canadians that this would be a great project to create short-term jobs for a couple years of construction work and to get money going into the Alberta government for royalties, don't we care about the rest of the world? Don't we care about climate change, millions of people dying? It's unethical in addition to a waste of money. So there became a point where I could no longer work at Trans Mountain. I'm glad I'm not there anymore. The people that I've met on this pipeline fight have been incredible. Um, the Indigenous people for hundreds of years have just been taken advantage of by our government. It's continuing to happen with this project. This project just makes reconciliation a complete joke. I'm not going to speak on behalf of Indigenous people. They're perfectly capable of speaking on their own. But I stand with them as an ally because they're being mistreated again in 2020. It's ridiculous. So Trans Mountain, when they first put this project forward, said it would create 37,000 jobs, which sounds like a lot, and that would be fantastic. But the way they do the math, and this was something that I saw when I worked there, was they try to, when they're promoting a project, make the benefits look as big as possible and make the risks look as small as possible. So that was very much the focus of information that I was providing from the environmental department for the people who are sending out information to the community. So with this 37,000 jobs, those aren't just people that work at Trans Mountain. They're called direct, indirect, and induced jobs. Direct jobs are contractors and employees. Indirect jobs and induced jobs is people who would get a service or a product from one of those employees. So example, if they have enough money to buy a car, that's an induced job for the car maker. If they have enough money to paint their place, the painter's job is considered to be a job for Trans Mountain. It makes no sense. And this is not math that Trans Mountain has come up with on their own. This is how the economics of projects are put forward. But it overly exaggerates the benefits in a way that's very confusing, I think, to the public and makes it sound like a much more beneficial project than it actually is. So one of the things in terms of trying to focus everyone's attention on the benefits rather than on the risks is they'll say, we've got equipment to clean up spills. The reality is if they have a spill into a river or into the ocean, they'll be lucky if they can get 10% of that recovered. So if you imagine you're making an oil and vinegar dressing and you shake it all up in a bottle, those tiny little oil droplets are what happens in a river that's moving quickly. There's no equipment to take that out of a river. The only equipment they have is if the oil behaves very well, it stays on the surface, it doesn't sink, it doesn't evaporate, it's just there in a way that they can corral and then suck into a tank or into a ship. That's not the real world. So we just have to look at what happened with the Exxon Valdez spill in 1989. 250,000 seabirds died. 3,000 green mammals, including whales and seals, were killed. Billions of herring roe were smothered. So they're not gonna tell you that a spill will cause billions of dollars worth of damage to the fishing industry, to tourism, and endanger people's lives. That doesn't go in the promotional information. They say we have state-of-the-art equipment. Sounds like we've got a rocket ship to the moon. It's changed very little in decades and is very, very ineffective. So don't allow them to make you feel comfortable with the risks because the risks are severe. A spill on Burnaby Mountain in a highly populated area will sicken a million people out of the two million people in the Lower Mainland if it's a substantial spill and they're breathing in those fumes. That tank farm shouldn't even be in a residential area. If that was in Alberta, it would be an industrial site. People don't realize they're living in the kill zone. So a million people would be sickened, but, but anyone within five kilometers of that tank farm could be killed from a fire, from an explosion, and from fumes. The fumes from the tar sands have a toxic gas called H2S that will basically make it impossible for you to breathe in seconds if it's concentrated enough. So there's risks for their employees, there's risks for the community. We don't need this. We need to transition away. We have renewable energy, it's affordable, it's available. 
but is playing in this un unfair playing field with oil and gas, where the billions of dollars of subsidies are going to oil and gas instead of going to customers, communities, and the renewable energy sector. I just want to make it clear that I'm not anti-Alberta. Half my family's from Alberta, I love Alberta. My beef is not with Alberta or the people who live there or the people who work there. Uh, my beef is with the oil and gas industry and how they have captured the government and have captured the subsidies, they control the regulations and all of those sorts of things. So I just want to make that clear. But the other thing that I want to say is that many of the jobs in the oil and gas industry could easily be transferable over to the renewable energy industry. I don't want to put people out of work. I don't want them to be trying to struggle to put food on the table. But if you're an electrician in the tar sands, you can be an electrician working on a solar energy project. If you're a welder in the tar sands, you can be welding blades for wind turbines. These jobs are transferable. But what we need is the industry to grow and develop and for them to have enough customers to be able to sell these products and sell these services and be profitable. And that's an uphill battle when you don't have support from the government through regulations and the subsidies that the oil and gas industry has been getting. Um, I'd like to talk about the southern re resident orca whales. We've got less than 100 left in the Salish Sea. With an increase in tanker traffic, that would be the result of this project. Their likelihood of surviving is close to zero. They have several different ways that they can be impacted by this project. They can be hit by tankers. The more traffic we have, the more likely it is that that would happen. If a spill occurs, the likelihood of their survival is very low. So the orca whales that were impacted by the Exxon Valdez up in Alberta, that pod is going extinct. There are no longer enough young females of reproductive age for them to reproduce. So even though there's a small number of them still there, they're dying out. That is a situation we could easily see in BC as well. The other issue with tanker traffic is the noise. So because they echolocate, they find their food and they communicate through sound. If they are not able to communicate, it makes them more difficult. It makes it more difficult for them to feed, and they're already many of them are already starving because of a lack of fish. So the impact to the orca whales is huge. So I want the international community to know that people in Canada, there are people in Canada who care about climate change in spite of the fact that our government's climate change plan makes no sense. Trudeau is saying we need to build a pipeline to burn more oil so that we have money to pay for climate change programs. This is completely illogical. So know that there's people here who realize that and they're working to prevent this project from moving forward. And if you are someone who works in the oil and gas industry, think about your future. Think about not just the short term, but the long term. Uh, the price of oil is falling. The demand for oil, I believe, is going to continue to fall as renewable energy becomes cheaper and electric cars become cheaper and that demand just starts to drop off and really think about how you can transfer the skills that you have right now into a job that doesn't damage the climate. And if you don't see opportunities there, I encourage you to speak to politicians in your community and say, where are the programs for the future? How are we gonna get out of this pandemic and transition into a decarbonized, clean environment? If you don't work in the oil sands and you care about these kinds of projects, please come and join us at protests, at demonstrations, you don't have to break the law. You don't have to cause any trouble. They're peaceful protests, but come and show your support for the indigenous people who are being mistreated and for the environment and for your future, for the children and for your grandchildren. Thank you. Go baby.